Okay, my friends, welcome here to Wake Up TV. This is Garrett J. White, the Master Coach Mentor, creator of the Warrior 90 Day Challenge, and also the host here of Wake Up TV. We are in for a treat this week, and like every single week, I have this insatiable desire to simply do this, and that is to make sure that I misspell the names of all my guests prior to showing up uh, for their hangouts, and I, I'm not I'm not sure why I have such an addiction to this. Whoa, whoa, I got double play, but I do have an affinity for it. I have an affinity for misspelling names. Recently, on one of our TV uh, TV shows, I mispronounced a woman by the name of Yara, and I called her Bob. Now, I did this half out of joking, but, you know, Yara, Bob, kind of close, kind of not close at all. Not going to be that off. We, uh, we had Christian... And we had like Christian, I, who knows? I was throwing some French in there. I don't know what I was doing. But we actually are legit for the first time on Wake Up TV. Some of All you right. might be sitting back and saying, well, you know, why are you legit? Well, I'll tell you why we're legit on Wake Up TV. Up to this point, you've been, the ship's being led by a PE teacher, my friends. A PE teacher. I might be able to do some pull-ups. might be able to run around a little bit. A little crazy, a little promoter here, run around. But today, my friends, we have a doctor. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We can now officially add doctor. We've had a lot of jackasses on uh, the show. We've had a lot of uh, shenanigans. We've had a lot of immaturity. We've had a lot of, well, real powerful principles and concepts, but yet to have a doctor. So I'm excited today for our doctor. And before I bring our doctor, a doctor, I mean, it's just impressive because I went to school and got a degree in kickball. Anybody who went to school in longer than, you know, a few years of playing kickball and badminton in order to get a degree, you are A-OK -okay in my book. So here's the deal. Wake Up TV as well as M3 Radio and all the rest of the comings and goings of the Wake Up Warrior Movement is here to really support you in doing one thing, and that is to have it all. Now, we have this premise here at Wake Up TV and all of our different programmings, which is this is men and women today as warrior males and females. We have been called to live a life that is connected to having it all. And what do I mean by this? Well, having it all in your body, having it all in your beingness, having it all in your balance of your relationship, and having it all in your business. We call this your core four. Now, today's specific topic, we're going to be discussing the relationship of having it all to the category we call balance, which is dealing with your relationships and intimacy and communication and actually even dealing with the most important relationship you could ever have, which is a relationship with you. So I, I search long and hard. I search long and hard to find us uh, an expert. Uh, and uh, I didn't have to search far because uh, in one of my masterminds here uh, with one of my mentors, Kevin Nations, we, uh, I had the chance to sit down actually on a park bench. Now, interestingly enough, this park bench that we sat on and had our first real intimate connection was uh, not actually in a park. But I'm sure at some level they call it a park bench because it looks like a park bench. It looked like a bench that could be in a park, but it wasn't in a park. It was actually underneath the hotel in the basement hideout VIP section where you can only go if a bus is coming to pick you up and and we got left by the bus and so there I sat on a bench a park bench if you will and I, I was lonely feeling sorry for myself uh, started sucking my thumb and guess what next showed up a doctor so uh, Dr. Ken do people call you Dr. Ken welcome to the show uh, some people do call me Dr. Ken uh, Garrett yeah, just just like they call you uh, many things. Yeah, they you know, they call you Doctor Ken, and and recently I've had people say you're an asshole, and I'm like, okay, well, all right, well, we got Doctor Ken, and we got the asshole sitting on the bench at the hotel. What hotel were we at? Was it the Win? I don't remember. No, Aria. Was it the Aria? It was the Aria, and we were yeah, we were down in the basement in the parking area, waiting That's for right. us that didn't come. <laughs> for, we were or waiting came for and a went. bus. Yeah, but came and went and left us, and uh, the and the team we were with pretty much said, "Hey, you know what, guys? We don't really want uh, we don't really want you guys we don't want you guys to come," right. and that's what bonded us. That's how that's why me and Doctor Ken were so tight because we were two uh, thrown to the wayside vagabonds drifting in the wind, and uh, and we connected. Now, in all seriousness, bro, we're gonna we're gonna start today's show off, and, and I'm gonna. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you kind of the pointer here as to why for our listeners why I brought uh, brought Doctor Ken on. I, I like calling you Dr. Ken. Is that cool That's if cool. I just continue? That's all right. That? Okay. All right. Well, and I think it's part of me just like feeling self-conscious about misspelling your last name so many damn times on every marketing piece we ran for this. So, well, let's tell the rest of the story. I, I misplaced the hour this program was supposed to start. You That's know, it was going to be at 12 o'clock, and I put it up at 11 o'clock Pacific, and uh, it's right there in my book at 12 o'clock. 
I have no idea. It was some divine inspiration, I'm sure. No, I, I think it was something simpler. I think you were just trying to punch me. You were trying to give me a little uppercut. I was like, I'll show you, dude. I'm a doctor. I'm going to do some reverse psychology on you. All right. You, uh, you won up me here with the misspelling, and you gave it to me with the wrong time. So it, it, wrong time, right time, misspelling. One thing I am going to point out is this. You have a microphone. I do. Is it working? Oh, it's working fantastic. I mean, usually I try to use my microphone and make sure my guests don't have a microphone so that I, I sound significantly more important. And here you are now leveling up the game. Your first believe, guest has come on with a mic. I believe you're going to hold your own, Garrett. I, I think you can <laughs> handle this. I mean, your your little holder case is even cooler than mine. I mean, my my holder case is like it's like this thing right here. It's not nearly cool. You have like one of the official, like, can you move that thing around? Does it oh, move yeah. around? Oh, yeah. See? See all that? That's unreal. That's yeah, it unreal. goes up, comes down. Yeah, well, I would expect nothing less from a doctor. So <laughs> here's the deal. Dr. Ken, for our viewers yeah. who are here and for all the people who are going to see this on replay here over the next couple of days, as well as individuals years into the future, following the warrior movement and also following maximum potential, um, talk to us real quickly. Introduce me to who you are. If I'm, if I'm new to the show, what do I need to know about you? Uh, if I'm seeing this for the first time and I'm watching this video, I'm watching this Hangout Live, what do I need to know about you? Who are you to the core? What, what, what would you want people to know about you? And then I'm, I've got a whole series of crazy series of questions I'm going to be asking you because you're an expert in so many categories in which I am not. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm a psychologist, so I have a PhD in psychology. I went to graduate school, got that degree. My first job was as a teacher, professor at... Uh, at actually at UC Davis, I taught for a year there as a lecturer. Then I went to a program, and uh, it was Lone Mountain College. It's now a part of the University of San Francisco. They had a graduate program in clinical psychology, and I administered that and taught undergraduates. And I walked on at the San Francisco VA Hospital because I wanted to do clinical work. This was I was administering a program that was about clinical work. My degree was about personality and social psychology. Um, but in the middle of my practice somewhere, I started doing a lot of family therapy and families started bringing in kids who were not achieving in school. And I listened to the way the parents talked to them and I thought, I hear something that they're not hearing and I don't know if anybody else is hearing either. And that is that instead of just simply saying, look, school's important, you got to work on it, you got to do it. They were saying, why don't you do it, honey? And they were saying things like, please, uh, please try. Well, if you tell somebody to try, uh, all they've got to do is show up and they can say they tried. If you say please, you're begging. Uh, if you threaten them and you say, you, you've got to do it or I'll ground you, then you're still giving them the choice as to what they do. You're saying, you're in the driver's seat but I'm going to react to you and I'm either going to punish you or you know, reward you. So I heard all that and I realized that what the parents needed to do was just give simple directives to their kids. Not authoritarianly, but just say, look, I'm your, I'm your parent and this is my call. You got to do well in your schoolwork. I give you lots of other you know, freedoms and so on, but with school, this is a this is a non-starter. Uh, we're not going to have a discussion. This is just something you got to do. When they did that, and when I took the kids and put them in a group and said, "Your issues are choice and personal responsibility. You get pissed off because your parents try to run your life, but the reason they're running your life is you're like screaming for somebody to run your life because you're making a mess of it." And I would talk to them straight, exactly that way. I even talked in front of their parents and said. Look, your kid's 15 years old. Kids who are 15 make stupid decisions. You know, he's he's dumb like a 15-year-old is dumb. Then I would talk to them privately. They would never complain about that because what I was really saying is you're expecting your son or daughter to have maturity they don't have yet. Your parenting job is not done. And you can't outsource your parenting parenting to me. I won't do it. So that's why I always saw families together. But I took the kids, put them in a group, and talked about choice, personal responsibility, how to set goals, and how to run their own life. We did not talk about school unless they brought it up. I knew they didn't need study skills help. These kids were brilliant. But they were just coasting because school was so boring for them.
So I told the parents, look, your kid doesn't have to be entertained all the time. Boredom is one of those things in life you need to learn how to manage. So you've got to tell your kid, look, I get it. You're smart. School is boring. You still got to do it. You still have to handle it. And then I took the parents and I set them aside and I said, do you realize you are creating an ethical dilemma for your child? Have you ever thought of the issue as not that your child is lazy or anything else, but that he is or she is simply choosing not to keep agreements that they make by just going to school? But are you insisting that they keep the agreement? Agreement. So we would do a lot with the parents about how to have a different kind of conversation with their kids. So here's what happened. In about 14 weeks, these kids, we had all their grades for all their academic subjects. We didn't care what they did in PE. But the grade point average was usually well below what their IQ said they could do. So in 14 weeks, the average increase for the first 46 families that came through, the average increase in grade point was six cents of a grade point. Cool on a four-point scale. They go from 3.2 to a 3.8. They go from a, you can do the math. Mm -hmm. But I was interested in what would happen six months after they're not with us. Do they maintain it? Do they, how does it go? Six months later, they were at eight-tenths of a grade point. No further contact with me. So it sure looked like they'd actually learned something. Their parents said so. The conversations at home completely were different. So this is a long story, Garrett, but stay with me. Uh, dude, I but I, I, I'm not falling I, asleep. I'm right here. Okay. The only thing that's getting me right now is you say, well, we, we didn't grade PE. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the PE teacher, of course, in me is saying, oh, well, well, that's why we run into an obesity epidemic here because even the doctor is saying, well, you know, Peach me. I'm just kidding, dude. I'm following you big time. I'm All getting right. this. I mean, I've got like 20 questions. I'm going to be picking apart here. This. Keep going. Right. All with this. Okay. So I wind up on KQED FM, the NPR affiliate in San Francisco, because people hear about my program. They hear it's doing well. I go on, and it's a it's a talk show on a Sunday night called Family Talk. And you're interviewed for 20 minutes, and then there's a host and a co-host, and they turn on the phones. Boom. All the lights go on on this little, uh, little huge switchboard. So we start taking calls. Late in the program, this guy calls in, and he says, Dr. Christian, um, everybody's talking about their kid. Uh, I don't have any kids. I'm, I've never been married, but I was that kid. Can you help me? Boom. It went through me like an arrow. And I managed to stumble out something like uh, blah, blah, blah. You can do this and you can do that. It wouldn't go away. I get, I'm getting goosebumps now. I get goosebumps every time I remember this moment because it changed my life and it changed my career. I went back to my team the next day. It's a Sunday night, now on Monday. I said, we've got to do something about this. So for the next four months, we went through all kinds of things, studying what we could do, what we could do, put together a program. Now, two years go by, three years go by, I'm now wanting to shop a book proposal and find a publisher because I want to write a book about my kids program. I get a great agent. She comes to San Francisco. She hands me a book. She says, look at this. We published this last year. I look at it. The table of contents almost looks exactly like the one I had proposed to write. Hmm. She then says, look, there are 70 books in print, 70 about underachieving kids. You will not even get looked at. Nobody will review your book. You said in your book proposal, though, that your second book would be about adults. We will represent you if you write the second book first. Can you do that in six weeks, or can you have the book proposal ready? I said, I'll do my best. Six months, I had the book proposal ready. <laughs> Sent it in. Harper Collins picked it up. Now, I moved to Paris to write my book even before I get a final contract. But I, I write a book called Your Own Worst Enemy, Breaking the Habit of Adult Underachievements, and from that time on, I spent my whole career on performance issues, how adults create boxes for themselves that they don't break out of, how they get caught by fear, hesitancy, shyness, or take too many risks, you know, take outrageous risks. And what that is is like building in an excuse for failure from the beginning. 
There's two main excuses that people use for staying small. I didn't try, they say. That's why I didn't really do it. Or, sure, other people are trying that easy stuff. I really went for it. Boom! I went really big time. And they fail gloriously. So they would like to fail gloriously and flail and go down in flames like some meteor, or they just hide. And people do that in relationships. They do it at their work. They do it when they're trying to schedule something that's in their book, and they put 11 o'clock instead of noon. That's underachieving. I, well, yeah, we could look at it as underachievement, or we could look at it as overachievement. You said, hey, you go, why, why would we wait till 12? We're just going to start at 11. I'm ready to go now. The world will revolve around me. Screw Gary and the team and the schedule of the show. We will do this at 11. Now, I'm going to back you up a little bit. I'm going to back you up a little bit because... There's a couple of things I want to I want to hear more about, and I, I think will be relevant to our listeners as we're talking about balance. Great setup um, for those that are hearing. I'm going to pull some screenshots here in a second and uh, show you the book that he's referencing as well as his site. And I'd encourage you to check check out both of them. Uh, and if the message, like every single week we bring somebody on the show, resonates with you again with Dr. Ken Christian, I would encourage you to reach out to him. We're going to give you some resources on that uh, to have a conversation with him. We got a lot of guys <clears throat> who are following the warrior movement who who don't quite, they're, they're on that fringe, and they're in that space, and even our top producers who are hesitant and holding back on a lot of the principles that uh, Dr. Christian is talking about, and so this is going to be relevant to you. Now, let's back up, though, to, to this. How do you decide to even go in this field, right? So you've, you've gone into the field, but you've now fractured that into a path that you're on right now. What led you into psychology? Like, why go this path? What what was the hook? Because you're not just, this isn't just like, hey, you know, eh, that might be kind of fun. Learn a little bit about the brain and why people do stuff. Like this became, you know, 20, 30 years of you committing your life uh, to this pursuit. But how did it begin? Why, why go into psychology for you? I went into psychology because I was interested in the mind. I took a psychology class in my freshman year. It was required. It was team taught by a guy who was actually a therapist and a guy who was a behaviorist. And they would sort of pair off and bounce off each other and t teach different parts of the class. So I'm in a class of maybe 70, 80 people, and I get the first exam results back. I've got the highest score in the class. Now, I in high school coasted. I don't know about you. High school was to dream, to sleep, and to see girls and date as many of them as you could. That's that, right. was what, that was what it was all about for me. And to laugh a lot and, and to be decidedly cool. I had to wear the cool shoes, the cool shirt. I was being cool and I was leaving behind grammar school where I got you know very interested in school because it was so boring. So I thought of myself as an underachiever in a way already and I, I regretted that I wasn't at a school though because I love learning. I regretted that I wasn't at a school that didn't demand more. But when I took this class the second exam, I get the highest grade again. The third exam, I get the highest grade, and I say, this is my major. This is what I want to do. I thought it would be threatening enough to my parents that it would kind of back them off. And uh, at the same time, it just seemed like a really cool deal. And besides, the guy who was teaching the class sat across from somebody and talked and made 50 bucks an hour, which in those days was real money. Oh yeah, so I just I just say you couldn't do a better thing than that. Well, and, and I, I know why you were doing what you're doing. Your parents wanted you to be a PE teacher. I know <laughs> it's true. I had to talk with them before the show. They said, "We're like, yeah, you know, uh, we wanted uh, we wanted Kenny to be a PE teacher and teach kickball like you, Garrett J. White, Mass Coach Mentor." But he derailed his entire future success and became a psychologist. Let me tell you something, Garrett. In yes. my high school. There was a color scheme for how you did on fitness tests. You st everybody started as a white, then you got red trunks, then you got blue trunks based on your fitness tests. Oh, well, then you could get purple, and those trunks were kind of silky and shiny. They looked like basketball pants. And then you could get gold. It got so easy for everybody to pass these tests at a high level. The guy who ran this program made something called navy blue. And as long as I was at the school, nobody had ever made navy blue. Then a bunch of people got it, including some women later after I left. But I was fit, dude. I got I my golds. 
I got I my know, gold. I, I believe it. You got the silkies, yeah. and then you went later in life and trying to relive your childhood, and you bought yeah. some purple silky shorts and the navy blues. You bought them. 26, like, 26 pull-ups, 32 bar dips. That's impressive. I, I couldn't yeah. do 26 pull-ups back in the day. So, I, I, yeah, the mockery. I can't the do them now. I can do three. CrossFit, buddy. We're going to get you into some CrossFit. <laughs> All yeah. right. So, so, dude, you head into there because there's a natural proclivity for you to go to it, number one. Number two, you have a passion for it. So this leads you into college, and you head into psychology. You're going into clinicals. You've graduated. You're now into doing the work, and this is where the shift starts coming. So what leads you to wanting to go the direction of children? So that was the first move I heard. So first, there was a passion and natural tendency towards psychology. Why did you choose uh, the path of working with kids, and then we've heard the shift of adults, and then we're going to shift the rest of our conversation to dealing with all you guys watching this right now, adults, and why you're jacked. That's oh, right. Yeah. yeah why you're jacked, yeah. and how we're going to get you unjacked out of the jack in the box box. So, what do you think? How, how did it go to kids? What What was the passion I, about going that direction? I did a little work with kids, and I didn't like working with kids alone. Sand trays, all that kind of stuff. Young kids, no. I got it what, what adolescents had going on, so that made sense to me. And the kids I saw were anywhere from middle school to high school to early college. But I always saw them with the family. What I was really intrigued by was orchestrating what was going on in the system. Okay. And it became, after you've done therapy one-on-one -on -one for a while, I don't know, if you're me, you're restless and you want to add something new, so then I did couple therapy, so then I did group therapy, always getting more people in the room. But then when it was the challenge of sitting across from a whole family and finding a way, it always reminded me of, you know, Luke Skywalker on the Death Star, you got to go down that little slot, you got to mm -hmm. find your way in. So, boom, I did it and it... it 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 really worked, but that's when I started seeing these adolescents come in with their parents. Eighty percent of the people came in and said, "My kid's smart and he's not doing well in school." So that's how I got interested in that. Working with kids alone, I did. I ran a group or two with adolescents, but what I did was really structured, and I I forced the kids to uh, examine things in a structured way. So they all thought of it as of it as a class, and the parents thought of it as a class. And then I did some sessions with the family. So I got into all that, and uh, it was like magic for me to work with a family because you could do, you could notice one thing they said, and it's like you take that thread and pull it, and boom. And I still do that. I work with underachieving people, and I can hear how they trap themselves just by listening to the language they use. People use very different language when they're amped up and focused than when they're maybe, maybe I'm gonna try. So a lot of people, a lot of people don't think that there's a connection. I, I talk to so many individuals week to week, month to month, um, day to day here in our warrior movement and in all the other programs I'm involved in right now and teaching and training and, and people don't see this connection between language and what they're saying and the realities that they're living. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that because I know that's a, that's a link and then let's transition that into how, what is the work that you've uncovered with with this underachievement in adults? I, this was fascinating when I when I first when I first started understanding what you were up to, um, and then here over the last couple of months as I've seen more and more of it, and here over the last week before the show as I've looked even more into it, uh, it's super fascinating to me. I, I can see the relevancy of a big time to top producer, particularly entrepreneurs. Um, but but come back here on the language side of things. Like, what have you noticed with people in language and this distinction that you just talked about? I, I got a, a, a guy that I mentioned in my book. This, this guy's name is Clive. I met him in Paris when I was there. Uh, every time I saw Clive, he was, he was saying things like, I'm going to do this. Um, I'm gonna, now I'm going to do this. I, I've got this plan. We're going to go here. We're going to go there. And then we're at a party, and he was talking about smoking. And he, he said, I think I might quit smoking. I think I might. That's not a definitive decision. Mm -hmm. It will be interesting to see how that works out. Don't you think it'll be interesting to see what I do? This is not the same Clive. I know he's not going to quit smoking. He gives it away with the way he structures the sentences. Because if he said, I'm going to hire that division, I'm going to move that over, I'm gonna, everything was exactly what he was going to do. It was definitive, present tense, or future tense. But it was declarative. I will, not I might. I think... I kind of, I mean, when people say, I kind of really want to do that, that's self-canceling. I kind of, 
I ca- okay, so so I, these self canceling words. What what have you noticed in patterns with them? Like when when do they come up and how are like? Because I don't think most most individuals when I say them, which I say them in times, and I, they come Me up too. to them much less than they've used to. But when when we're doing this as human beings, like is this something like we're consciously thinking is happening for us? No. Okay. No, so we we about. know language well. We know the conditional. I might, maybe I will kind of thing. Or I would if I could. We know what that is. We know what, and we don't have to think about it consciously. You don't say, oh, I'm going to talk about something now. I better use the present tense. You just use the present tense. It's automatic. But the language people grab automatically out of these bins expresses what their true position is. It can even be tone of voice. Check this out. I don't even talk with people about goals much anymore because here's what I hear. I hear from people all the time. What's your goal? Well, my goal is that means I don't expect to really do it, but I will say that my goal is I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. And then it should be followed. It's like you can hear it in their tone of voice, but I don't think I'll, I'll be able to pull that one off. Do you follow what I'm saying with tone totally. of voice? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not it's not just language and it's tone of voice in the way that people are saying things. So it's 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 what all I'm of saying, it. How I'm it's, saying. It. Yeah, it's all of it. How you're saying it. How you how clipped it sounds. Uh, remember this speech? I think it was Churchill. Yeah, during World War II. We will meet them in the battle. We will see them on the shore. We will, you know. And it's all this. We will. We will. We will. If a commander said. We're going to try to see what we can do about the Nazis this way and that way. The, the command would not be a command anymore. You would not feel that you could trust that leader. So when you're talking to your followers, mm-hmm. I don't hear you using, you might try. I hear you say, get off your ass and do it. That's this is true. That is a directive. So there's like, hey, you could try to get off your ass. And maybe yeah. possibly have it all. Or yeah. get off your ass and have it all. Don't or you could it. Yeah, or you could try getting off your ass and for sure you'd get more than you have now. And sure, you know, you, you we can't expect too much. But you know, if you really give it a good try, you know, it's really the effort. It's not you know, it's the process, man. <laughs> so here's the deal. How, how, what's going on in our society? Why why in the hell as a people have we become so weak? in our willingness to declare direct commitment. What are, what are your thoughts? I mean, you're, you see this. I, I study from a different place. In fact, I just punch people in the face and say, what's up? Let's go get off your ass. You, you actually understand a lot of the science to it, much more than I do at your profession. Um, talk about, like, how has our society actually supporting, or maybe it's not, maybe it's not. I don't know. My experience watching it is our entire society supports people being uh, lukewarm lay masses. Well, if you look at parenting, what goes on with mm-hmm. parenting these days, most parents program their kid from the time they're two years old. They're taking them to kinder gym and they're hopping around on a trampoline. Adult supervised. They're not playing outside. It's like we can't let them go do anything for themselves. And then they go to preschool and they're supervised. If they do any outside sports, they're supervised, supervised by, and then it's competitive, and then there's a team, and then the coach is running it. I used to go out and play ball in a field with people. We didn't, we didn't not know how to do that, and we didn't need a league in order for it to be cool. So there's this thing that's going on with parenting where parents swarm their kids, and I feel like kids are now parents' prize, prize heifers, like they're in the 4-H and they want this pig to grow really big and be, you know, something they can sell for a lot of money. And it's lining their trophy case. Some, they, parents, are they, doing a, some parents are doing a good job of this. Their kids are looking like large heifers. <laughs> That's true. And they're just following suit because the parents are large heifers. So, yeah, and they yeah. need fitness. They do. They need, well, and it's because back in the day, their psychologists didn't care about PE. That's, that's all. That's, they weren't measuring. They're like, ah, P.E. Shmi. We just need some heifers up in this 4-H place, huh? I'm just kidding, dude. So I, I get where you're going, going with this. Keep going with it because I see it happen in my neighborhood right now. My wife freaks out 
if my daughter – now, given our house is very large, and so like if my daughters disappear somewhere in the house, my wife freaks out. If my kids are down the street in the block, we live in this gated community. It's super safe. Like there's just nothing that happens here. Like it just like nothing happens here. And <clears throat> the kids run down the street. My wife freaks out. Like how is it that there is a freak out factor now as a parent that that didn't exist? Because I was the same way, man. We disappeared when I was a kid. We disappeared like ten hours. I want to see my mom. Like we were gone. Like boom, boom, kiss my mom. We we're out the door. Seven fifteen, bam. And we'd yeah. be back when it got dark. We had, I mean, yeah. but nowadays that's not happening. So yeah. what are you observing? Why is this happening? Any idea why? Like uh, any any in the concept in your mind as to, to why this is going on now? I literally think it has to do with some perversion of uh, self-esteem research that was, you know, the self-esteem movement was really big. So a kid has to have success. Mm -hmm. Kids don't, if everybody gets a trophy, they don't, they throw it away. They don't, it doesn't mean anything to them. Um, kids aren't allowed to suffer or struggle, and they need to struggle. How are they going to develop a real grit if they don't struggle through anything? So a gated community, it's kind of, uh, it, it makes me laugh a little bit, Garrett, given who you are, that you're inside a gated community. But I understand. But yeah, if they run down the street, I, my kids were, a, were on a, a lane that had some little, did it have speed bumps? I don't remember. But it, but it was a little lane, and across from it was an open field, seven acres, and weeds got really tall. They were out there as explorers, and they were inventing games all day long. And my daughter played softball, so she was in that league. And I think she played one other sport sometime. But softball was the deal, and I didn't want her in programmed activity the whole year round because I wanted her to figure out what, what meant something to her. She liked softball. That was cool for her. So, yeah, go go do softball. And I didn't want to coach their teams. I coached my second daughter's team one year. That's all. I retired. One year, in and out. In and out. It's all right. Nothing wrong. We went to the championship out. game. It was unfortunately lost due to tragically impaired umpiring. But <laughs> those things <laughs> happen. Sure. Tragically impaired, umpiring. Hey, let's come back to this gated thing. All right, listen. I would live right down where my office is on Laguna Beach, right there in the condos with my kids and my wife. And I happen to be married to a woman who hovers. Oh, okay. She's a hover. Like, I, I don't know where the hovering came from. But it's like I told you. Like, my daughter can be down the hallway and my wife panics. And uh, <laughs> like, it's like, oh, what are, what are the kids? And I'm like, I get it. So the anxiety levels get high. And it gets hard. Like I was, my, I dropped my daughter off of school today, and her her big response was, oh, "Dad, tonight I just want to play." Like this is her request because she has gymnastics on Tuesdays. We were going out as a family last night. Like a few nights ago, she had like a little. I don't remember what she had. She had something, <laughs> and that was all she wanted to do. She said, tonight she was like, "Dad, when I get home from school, can I? Can, I don't want to do anything except yeah. for just go down the street and play with my friends." Which right, I get it. Right. So how much yeah. is like coming back on 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 relationships and underachievement? Let's talk. Let's let's move it there. And as we kind of shift here towards the mid of the show, if you're watching Wake Up TV and you've not had an opportunity to download the Wake Up Warrior app, where you can find this show with all bunch of tips and tricks as well as transcripts from this show as well as all the other Wake Up TV episodes and every other coming and going of the Warrior Movement teaching you how to have it all. Make sure you swing on over to Wake Up Warrior app. Dot com It'd be some details overview of what the app is. It's a free free download for you, right to the palm of your hand on demand. 100% of the content, 100% of the time. So if you're wanting that as well as transcripts from this show, head on over to wakeupwarriorapp.com. Now, underachievement, my brother. Let's define this really quickly. How how would you define underachievement? And then let's let's go on a little journey here of underachievement with adults. Okay, if you as an adult feel like you've got talent that you haven't really developed. You know, you watch that other people are getting positions and they're not as even as smart as you, but you're letting them slide by. You're not taking very many risks. You're playing too small a game. You know that. I don't, I don't tell people you're an underachiever. I tell people if they ask me, it sounds like you're underachieving, but why take that on as a title? That's just something you're doing right now. So you can get past that, and you can take some new risks. But you know what? It, what it, part of it is, uh, Garrett, is that these days kids get so much done for them because everything's a group activity that they develop passivity. But also, if the if parents overpraise 
the intelligence of their kids and keep talking about how bright they are or how talented or how gifted they are, they make a fundamental error because intelligence is a state and it's like it's something given that you come with and you could decide that if you if things come easy for you that means you're smart if things start to come harder you could decide then easily that you're not as smart as you used to be or your smartness has now been met by the difficulty of the work and you can't go any higher so this woman came along named Carol Dweck and she said I'm gonna teach kids that their brain is a muscle and that what they can do is learn to exercise it and if they continue to persist and figure out a way to solve a problem that that's what intelligence really is is figuring out a way to solve something not just is it easy does it come quick when she tells that to kids they score off the charts their grades improve and their IQs actually go up which is completely freakish so they get, so she's created conditions for them to actually strive for something to strive exactly okay so underachievement in in general then we're looking at living beneath your potential and leaving yeah. beneath what you feel like is your capacity is is that what I'm hearing or is it something different than that you can you know if you've got smarts that you haven't used you know you've got talent you haven't used you know if you're coasting nobody has to really tell you that if it's a mystery to you then it might be something else but most pe people know I mean you can ask the most brilliant people who've accomplished a lot and you ask them how much of your potential have you used and they'll give a low number I mean they like maybe Asimov who wrote like 400 books would say yeah, I did a pretty good job but he wouldn't say I did everything I could have you know, there were 40 other books I was going to write one afternoon, and I just, you know, I <laughs> messed up. But, um, but I don't really believe in overachievement. I believe there are people who overwork, and they don't have balance. I believe that they get obsessed by accomplishing things. They get perfectionistic, and they lock themselves up, and they get very, very narrow with their lives. I also believe that hard work is frequently an escape from a relationship where you don't feel as smart there. You don't feel quite as solid there as you do, you know, teaching CrossFit or you do staying 60 hours hiding out at the office doing big memos and smoking a cigar or something. Okay, you just hit you just hit the nail on the head here, champ. Congratulations. We're at minute 39 into the show and we just hit probably the single most important concept I've heard come out of your mouth in relationship to the warrior movement so okay now we do, you just nailed this was me I mean this was me to the T as a banker for eight years until I lost and imploded and lost everything I would hide out in the gym hide out training for Iron Man hide out making money hide out being on stage speaking at huge events traveling to workshops doing this which by the way every single guy who's ever come into the wake up warrior brotherhood and people who follow the guys that follow me this is what they're doing they're running this racket and they're running and I was terrified I, I would complain about it all the time I would say I, I would come home and it was the one place I had no power I'd have power in, on a stage in front of 4,000 people come home two days later and walk through the door of my home and a five foot three hundred and five pound villain existed and I had no power so dude talk about this like talk because this is a real this is an issue I faced this issue and I wouldn't say I've really got a grip on it at a level that brought me happiness in my life until the last year and a half to two years um, but for you like discuss this more like I, I don't know what okay. else you want to add to this but yeah, I can no. tell we just hit oh. a vein on something okay to me everywhere people duck out it's like a showdown that they're gonna meet and they're afraid they're gonna lose so they duck out and they don't try so you're hiding in the way you're hiding other people hide in other ways it means that in some way what they learned about what they're supposed to do with a woman is be different from being real they're supposed to be either um, let's not discuss this I'm the man let me fix something I don't wanna talk um, it all puts you in a tippy toe way and of course if you've been gone that much you're gonna come home to somebody who's five three 
and now 107 pounds because they ate bonbons because there was nobody around feeding their soul. And so they spiritually felt depleted because their man is out gallivanting around the world and now he's home to have his shirts ironed. Got it. So they're like jockeys for these big race horses and they get to ride in, you know, short spurts, but the horse is out running around through the through the ground. Basically, fear of failure makes you hide. And a lot of people talk about fear of success. I think that's another version of fear of failure because here's the deal. If you're successful but you're afraid you won't know how to handle it or maintain it, then you'll still find a way to sabotage it. So a lot of people go up, you know, they're like one-hit wonders. They, you know, they have this explosion and then they can't hang on to it because they don't know how to do it. With relationships, they know how to meet a girl. They know how to look good dating, but they're not so sure about how to really be intimate with another person and let down. And you and I talking downstairs in that little bus terminal, we mm -hmm. actually started talking about what it li was like, what it felt like to be who we were. Men don't typically engage in those kind of conversations. They shoot the shit, they talk about sports, they have a beer. They, but it's possible for people to have conversations that aren't about fashion magazines, but still are about something like what it's like to be in a relationship with a woman and you're, and you're, you're not feeling like you're on really solid ground about some things. you got to face up to that. And what men don't do is, is do something that my ex-wife used to call, to call it talking regular, which meant to her, get, drop all the stuff. Let's just, let's just talk about what it's feeling like right now. Now, I, I didn't pass the test. I can never do that quite right for her. Um, but I also had some problems with her. We eventually parted, but we had quite a long marriage. And we raised two daughters and everything was cool. But I have not been married again, but I've had some tremendously intimate relationships with women since. And I'm talking soul to soul. And I think it's soul to soul that leads to transcendent sex. Sex that is scary to men because it's so good, because your soul is merging, not just your loins. Loins. I've always loins. liked that word, loins. Yeah, I like that word too. I feel a burning in my loins. Yes. I got it. Yeah, I got yeah. a burning in my loins, which really means, hey, I am horny, and uh, it is time. Horny. I mean, where does this come from, this word horny? I mean, loins, horny. It's just like a bunch. But here's the deal. I'm getting where you're I'm getting what you're talking about. My, my question for you is, is this. Like, if I'm in that place, I'm a guy. I'm talking to you here a couple years back, and I'm, I'm fearful of that kind of intimacy in a relationship with a woman, something beyond orgasm. Uh, it could involve sexuality, but it's beyond orgasm. It's something bigger. It was the sex and love making with my wife last night. It was something bigger. I can always tell when it's really soul to soul because I'm filled up for days. Like for days. Like my, my whole being is just filled up. Like I just see her and I'm just like, oh, I love you. And it doesn't always have to be something sexual, but I've just noticed that when we have sex and it's that kind of connection, I'm full. Now, I don't really understand what the hell's going on, except for the fact that like I feel the difference. If you're coaching me a couple of years back, you're coaching guys who aren't really getting this idea of underachievement is ultimately not living to your full potential in relationships, and that a lot of that comes back to being willing to, what I'm hearing you say, be real, um, how... how like, how do you coach a guy like that? How do you coach? What what advice would you give to our viewers who are sitting here? Like, what steps do they take? How does somebody start stop going from this underachievement way of seeing life that it's okay for me to be a half-assed living man and awaken to the possibility that listen, I could have all, I could have it all, and one of the areas I could have it all is in a relationship that matters, deeply connected at all different levels. Like, guide them there from that place. What, what okay. would you say? Here's the way you have it all. You don't try to have it all before you get close and intimate with your wife or your lover or whoever it is. The way you have it all is to start by saying, I feel really clumsy and awkward when you want to talk. 
I feel shy. I don't I don't know what you really want from me. Can you can you indulge me when I'm taking baby steps here? I I want to learn to really talk to you. I think that's, I think I've avoid it all the time because I'm afraid I'm going to get in over my head or I'm going to do something stupid or I'm going to make you mad. You're good, man. I'm here with you. I I don't see your I I don't oh, see you. So that's you why I stopped. No, you don't see me cuz I put your screen up there, buddy. Oh, okay. I okay. Mac, I wanted them to see I wanted them to see right now as I'm talking. Every time I talk, I will have become transformed okay. into Dr. Ken Christian. No, I'm okay, just going to maxpotential.com. I just want to be able to see it cuz we're going to reference that page here in a moment. So keep going. All right. So so if you are willing to acknowledge exactly where you are, you will be met there. If you want to melt a woman down, if she's well disposed to you. Now, if, if the relationship is burnt toast already, you may have some difficulty overcoming the tension between you. But, but that kind of candor, just being dead honest, you know, I don't really understand how to talk. I, I didn't have any experience with that. Garrett, did you have a sister? Or did you yeah. have all brothers? You had a sister? Yeah, older, I younger? Three. I was oldest. So I had three sisters. It was me, my sister, my brother, and then my two younger sisters. Yeah. Okay. So they were all younger kids than you. So you were kind yeah. of one up with them and a little more the guy in charge. And that's oh, your yeah. style. I was, I was a third parent. Yeah. For sure. Okay. I think sometimes men who've had only brothers. I, I My best friend had four other brothers. And he said, how do you talk to girls? I don't even know. I had an older sister. So I always had a female presence who was a little older than me around. But I I still know, and I think you know, Garrett, that if you were to go in and talk to your sweetheart and say, I know there's more that, that I could be with you, and I know there's more that we could be real about. I know there's more that we could talk about. I don't talk to you about my fears because I'm afraid that's not gonna that's not gonna be manly and it's not gonna turn you on. I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't talk to to you about how I'm not always sexually satisfied. I don't talk to you about how sometimes I'm not sure I really pleasured you. Um, I can get on a stage and I know how to rock it. This, this could be you talking, but when I'm across from you, I feel like I'm 11 years old and don't know quite what to do because I'm around a girl. I, know, I think she wants me to kiss her. You know that whole shyness that mm -hmm. comes at a certain age? Mm -hmm. We can emotionally be at that kind of level because we didn't go ahead and grow that part of us up because we could pass over it by being macho or some uh, expressing some other element of who we are and that's that's a master school to do that in fact relationships there's a guy I read is, this guy's a philosopher from uh, Germany or something his name is Kaiser Kaiserling and Kaiserling wrote a book called the book of marriage it's dense he wanted all these experts to write things but his opening essay is that marriage is something that every culture sells to its youth because the wisdom of every culture is that if you put two young people in a marriage they will be forced to develop because a marriage requires you for it to be successful to be true to yourself to treat yourself as well as you can but it requires you to also meet every need you can meet for the person you're with without going against yourself that's that's like a koan that's like how you know what's the sound of one hand clapping mm -hmm. you can't easily 
make sure you take care of yourself and take care of the other person's needs without having conversations that are real and earnest. And it's a tough it's a tough request anyway. This was a gay this was a gateway for me. I mean this is this is what changed I, I finally got to that place, you know, with our my little code mantra with my brand and also we're doing wake up warrior movement, be real, get raw, stay relevant. And that uh, that was really hard. And that was the first step for me too. Was I had to get honest. And I got I got to get honest because I was so I was so exhausted um trying to pretend. I, I was just exhausted. I, I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, completely exhausted with pretending like I was confident in the bedroom, pretending like I was confident in my communication skills with my wife, pretending like I didn't feel unworthy, didn't feel like any moment now the hat was going to drop and this gorgeous woman I was married to was going to figure out I was total douchebag and going to leave me. Like these were all, these fears were coming up and when I got to the point where I was too exhausted, I, I finally just shared. I said, here's where I'm at. Like I'm terrified of you. Like you turn your back to me and and you do these things because like I get it because I'm a 15 year old perverted kid. Like that's the way I, I energetically probably show up and that's got to yeah. be horrifically unattractive to you. But I don't right. know how to not be this kid because I got jacked sexually at 15. Like it, since that point, like I never evolved. Like I don't know how I can be fit. I can do Iron Man. I can speak. I can market. I can sell. I can kick ass in all these areas, but man, in this area, I don't know how. Communication, I don't know how to do this either. I was like, I don't know what to say to you. I'm scared. And these were the conversations that started us yeah. down the journey to where we are now, but these conversations started two and a half years ago, three years ago, and they were ugly as hell when they started because I had no yeah. idea, no training. I was just like, fuck. Yeah. yeah. I was at a speaker's conference recently about how to be interviewed on media, and we all role-played. And everybody looked like whales trying to dance on the beach. I mean, we just flopped around, and it was a disaster. And I thought, this is what it's like when we're kids, and this is what we shun when we're adults. So we're, we're so sleek and so powerful in so many ways. Who wants to feel like you're a doofus or you're a lame brain or dumb? And then we've got all these roles we're supposed to fulfill. I mean, you're talking warriors. You're the leader of a bunch of warriors. You've carved out something for yourself, dude, that's heavy to do. But you talk also, because I've watched you, about being real and the integrity. I mean, I've seen you strip off any number of masks over the time I've known you, where you just say, dudes, here's where I was last week. Boom. Now, translating that to any one person's lover or soulmate or whatever is really easy. Don't think it's hard. You're going to make it hard by imagining it's hard. If you say that's really hard, I've really got to be ready, you're just postponing it. If you wait to do anything, it's a postponement. When you say I want to think about it a little bit longer, it's a postponement. You need to realize you're constantly postponing things, but the moment to deal with them is always now. There isn't any other moment because it's the only one you have. When you finally do it, it'll be now and you will feel unprepared, not ready. It's because you're learning. That's what learning is like. Being, you know, feeling like you're that whale trying to dance on sand. It's okay. Meet the other person. If that person does not receive you and does not melt and does not throw her arms around you, you may be with the wrong person or there's still something that you've done that actually has scarred something between the two of you and it has to be worked through. But that's just one more thing. I mean, what were you going to do with your time anyway? Read a car magazine? There's only so much CrossFit you can do. So, you know, after you've done that, you're going to come home and you're going to face Garrett's dilemma. You've got to come alive to the part of you that's scary and shy and let that guy start doing some reps in the gym. Let yourself start to talk from wherever you are. Thaddeus Golis wrote a book called The Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment and he said there's only one thing to do. Just start where you are and accept where you are. Acknowledge where you are. 
don't vaunt that you have to be something else. Garrett, I don't know if you even know this. I think I mentioned this to you. My father was a pastor. My mother was a pastor's wife. I got messages early on that I was supposed to be an example. You know how long it takes to get over the idea that you're supposed to be exemplary, an example, an exemplar of whatever. It, it's all about perfection. And and in the mastermind you're both, uh, you you are you and I are both in. I have run into that so many times. I can't tell you. It has been like a school for me. I mean, I've I've always been in therapy because I believe in it and I do it. And for me to keep my sharp myself sharp, it'd be like if you knew how to be fit and you didn't go to the gym. I've got to be in therapy to keep myself zeroed in, to keep myself locked in, to make sure I'm processing well. Because I do delicate surgery and it's a blast to do. And I can see things and I move in and I un you know, I remember when you had pickup sticks and you can move that one pickup stick and then you can move all the others? Mm -hmm. It's like that's what it's like to do the kind of work I do. I'm like a bomb squad and I'm disarming something. And it's a blast and the tension goes up. But man, did I not know how to talk to my, I mean, we talked a lot, my wife and I. We were buddies, but there were areas we couldn't have good conversations in. So now I think I have better conversations. I know I have better conversations because I'm willing to say what's on my mind because if they don't like what's on my mind, then I'm going to have to be false in order to maintain this relationship. So I just put it out. I'm not aggressive. I don't need to be aggressive. I don't need to blow somebody away. But I do say, I don't get where you're going. Why did you say that? What does that mean? Um, what was your intention just now? And then I'm checking mine. What was my intention? Why did I say that? Why did I use that tone of voice? That's like the work that isn't as easy for us. Girls get a lot of positive reinforcement for their feelings. So much so that they can use whining and crying and tears as a method for control, and that's not to their that's not to their benefit. Uh, you know, a lot of people who put on emotional displays, <laughs> it's like if the phone rings and they're you know they're going through this big emotional thing, but the phone rings, they go, "Hey, dude, oh, hi, how are you?" And they're fine. And it's like that's a tip off that it's partly an act, and they're enacting something. So women can go in those directions, and that's a stereotype. But some stereotypes get to be stereotypes because they're true. Some cliches are cliches because they speak the truth. Um, and not all. We can do a lot of ugly stereotyping. But, you know, men are maybe a little from Mars. Women really are a little from Venus. But those two planets have to get along and be in the same solar system. And it only happens if Mars is willing to be Mars and be educated by Venus. And if Venus is willing to be Venus, and be educated by Mars. We're in a school when it's a relationship and it is a tough one and we're seduced into it like uh, Kaiserling said and everybody knows that it's going to be more difficult than anything else you've ever done with per perhaps the exception of being a parent at certain moments which has a huge impact on us. But that's, that's uh, I'm now getting long winded Garrett bump me, do something. You're Tell good, me. you're good. Dude, you've, been, you've been doing a great job. Well, I, I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of things as we kind of come to the close of our show today. If you're hearing, as you're hearing this, I can tell you sitting on the bench underneath the hotel as we were waiting for the shuttle to come back that had so wonderfully left us behind, uh, and Dr. Ken and I got a chance to sit and talk, and then we got to spend time through with that weekend at a mastermind rat, and then I've gotten to chance to connect with him more and more over time. The one thing I can tell you is that the presence of this man allows you to experience something inside yourself that is difficult to experience when you're not in the presence of someone who knows how to hold presence. Now this is this is a key factor. I felt this sitting on the bench that day and actually during that mastermind weekend I was going through some really intense stuff in my own marriage. Uh, me and Danielle were, were confronting some things that were very painful and, and uh, Dr. Ken, I don't know if you remember that or not, but it was that weekend was very difficult for me in the mastermind because I had chosen to level up my marriage again which forced me to engage in conflict and engage in conversations that were painful but after a couple of years of learning that that was the only way to get to the next level it was there and if you see here on the page on this video if you're watching right now you'll see this on maxpotential.com 
I actually screen shared the site uh, where <clears throat> Dr. Christian uh, holds his work. You'll see the book that he's talking about, Your Own Worst Enemy, uh, as well as a, an opportunity for you to get a complimentary uh, experience uh, at some level with him. So, you know, Dr. Kim, why don't you give us a, a little summary here of, I'm not sure exactly how that works or, or if there's some free video training or if, uh, if they can actually go directly to you to have a session, um, how that would work. Because I can know, again, you gave me a mini session sitting on the, the bench <laughs> that day. Um, and I'm sure that's how it just kind of rolls for you around town. So for those who may not be as fortunate enough to be in high ticket masterminds with you and are looking to to have that kind of experience, uh, what would they need to do next to pull that off? Uh, are they seeing the website right now like I am? Is that what they're looking at? Uh-huh. Yeah. It says get, get complimentary training. What you do is if you give me your name and address, uh, you're going to get, whoa, it's like 17, 18 videos that are, um, you know, and it starts with this, how to rip the lid off your success. That's the first thing, uh, which was a webinar I did. But uh, you get you get training, you get a lot of videos, and then you get opportunities to work with me if you want. If you click on the button on my website that says Breakout Programs, uh, then you're able to apply for an appointment. I have videos on each of these pages so you can do that but there's there's the um, max potential breakout appointment application and I bundle a series of things that I do under this breakout label because what I'm interested in is you know those people uh, this happens with athletes they hit they hit a certain kind of level their talent is good uh, there's gonna be a baseball player now that baseball season is coming up who has a breakout year when he goes from being somebody with a lot of potential to actually actualizing it, really suddenly hitting over 300, having, having some pop in his bat. But people break out in, in you hear it about actors. That was a breakout performance or a breakout role they had. And what I'm interested in is taking that potential and then catalyzing it. And I work with people in very concentrated ways, in small groups, to quickly reach new dimensions and who they are and to not set goals but to decide on some deliverables and we're looking for one that has a lot of leverage because you can change one thing and everything else starts to move because of changing that one thing and it's my job to help you find what that one thing is and I start it here with a phone conversation that comes if you filled out this max potential breakout appointment application. All right, so there you see right there, I'm going to actually, when I talk, it'll pull it up even bigger for you on the screen. You'll be able to see that, the Max Potential Breakout Appointments uh, application. If you look on his site, uh, I'll kind of guide you through how I got there. Uh, you come to the main site uh, here at maxpotential.com. You'll come down here to the Breakout Programs, and then you'll come over here to where his, uh, and these videos, I've watched all of them. They're very, very powerful, uh, and he goes through a lot of his story and a lot of the concepts that, uh, that he stands for. I encourage you to check those out. Also, if you click here, Apply for an Appointment, Again, I'll bring you over here to the breakout session, uh, and you can assign that uh, and get on his schedule for uh, a free strategy session, a free breakthrough session with him, uh, and see what comes from it. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times, how many conversations I've had. At one point, I had six coaches at the same time, all working on my mind and my soul, and uh, so I, I had uh, I had about uh, five or six Dr. Kens in my life. Um, after about a year and a half of doing this. From 2009 to 2010, I was so overwhelmed and had begun to not trust myself at all because I was constantly looking at all my coaches as gods and prophets uh, who just knew the future for me, so I wouldn't make any decisions, and I would be like, well, what do you think? And then, so I burned it all, and I went, but it was it was the most crucial two years for me ever, and I still have coaches who work, you know, most recently, Jesse Elder and a couple of others who I've worked with who, who work guiding me on this path. And I'd encourage you, if you felt it during today's show, and uh, Ken is a little more your style maybe than how I've even showed up, I'm glad that we were here on Wake Up TV, been able to give you some exposure. And we watch this happen every single week on Wake Up TV where you're following the message, you're hearing the message, but you needed to hear it in a different voice. You needed to hear it from a different person who happened to resonate with you at this point in your life where maybe the struggle for you was in balance. 
And that's the place. And that's why we put on Wake, TV, Wake Up TV every single week to bring in a different angle of the same conversation, which is uh, having it all. And uh, Dr. Christian, as we close up for today's show, this is today's episode, anything, any final thoughts you'd like to share with them uh, before we wrap up? No, I, I, I do want to say thank you for having me on because I felt honored that you asked me and I love that, that conversation and any other contact we've ever had. And I think your work is so important. It's, um, it's like the most impressive thing I've seen a PE coach do. Yeah. So I just, I want to tell you. But I, but I love PE coaches actually. So but you you don't have to throw that in there. I know I know you're no, true. But I love PE colors. coaches. I, I promise. I really came through <laughs> about PE teachers. That's all right. The true. I mean, as Jack Black said in in one of his movies in the past, he said, you know, those who can't do teach and those who can't teach teach PE, and that was where you found me uh, at the bottom of the totem pole. Well, Dr. Christian, I sure appreciate you being here today. Have loved having you here again. For those that are watching the show. Uh, here you can check him out at maxpotential.com and I would encourage you to head on over there. Worst case scenario, you have a, a fantastic conversation over an hour. Best case scenario is you get on and everything in your life changes, particularly when it comes to your relationship because the hell I was in for years and years and years in my marriage did not liberate until I had someone like Dr. Ken Christian who could guide me through that conversation. So if you know that's you and you know it's time for you to have that conversation, you know what to do next, head on over to Max Potential. As we wrap up today's show, I want to remind you about one powerful thing, and that is simply this, my friends, that the Wake Up Warrior app is your gateway to being able to get access to all of the content here in the Wake Up Warrior movement, as well as what you are got going on here with Dr. Ken Christian today, transcripts from today's show, as well as all the episodes we got going on every week. So if you have not taken the opportunity to get the free app, head on over to wakeupwarriorapp.com. And final thought with those who are, again are looking to take it to the next level, head on over to maxpotential.com and I encourage you to have a session uh, with Dr. Gan Christian. As you go forward today though, my friends, remember that power in today's marketplace as a modern day warrior comes down to the simple formula of authenticity. Be real, get raw, and stay relevant with a ruthless commitment to creating big ass results today. <laughs>